Well, praise God. It's good to be here. Amen. Amen. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to stand here. I don't want you to ever think I take it lightly or I take it for granted because I know what kind of man stands in this pulpit. Amen. I know what kind of man he is and I know the hours and the times that he prays and the blood and the sweat and the tears that he puts in for this church. So I want you to know that it's an honor. And I'm thankful that all of you have come out. It's just here lately really has been bothering me, Sister Susan. I just, I don't understand. You know, we got the Ukraine over there fighting. You know, we've got the Chinese that are having churches underground. But in America, we've got the liberty. We've got the freedom to come and go as we please. The doors are wide open, and yet the churches are empty. You know, it's been a big burden on my heart, and I've been asking God, I, what, do I, what can I do, God? Because whatever I can do to help to get people to come to church is what I want to do. You know, I was thinking about the Scripture the other day. Matter of fact, this afternoon as well. The sports arena, Walmart, the movies, all these different places have no problem getting people to come to their facilities. they selling out. Concerts will sell out. I know a young lady told me, she said she set up most of the night waiting for the tickets to come open within 30 seconds. She submitted it, said tickets sold out. 30 seconds, they sold out a concert down here at the racetrack. And, you know, I think about it, and the Lord's really been dealing with me with it. And, you know, I see people, and I hear people talking, and they're just like, well, as long as my kids just go to a church, that's all that matters. Brother Allen, that's so, so not the truth. That is, that's a scary statement to hear somebody say, a parent that supposedly loves their children, to say, as long as they're in a church, that's all that matters. No, they need to be in a Holy Ghost filled church. They need to be where the man of God is pouring out his heart and giving everything that he's got, where the worship is pouring out and people are being saved and people are being set free and marriages are being restored. Don't just say it's okay because they're at a church because that's not right. The devil don't mind you sitting in a church as long as you don't change. If you live like the devil all week and you still act like the devil, he don't care. He would rather prefer that. And I've been thinking about it. You know, just the other day I was on Facebook and I was scrolling and a friend of mine told me a long time ago, he said, every time you scroll on Facebook, another one's died and gone to hell. And I think about it and I just, I ask God, what can I do? Because the Bible says that hell is enlarging herself. Making herself larger. It never was the intent of God for anybody to die and go to hell, that was never the intent of God. So if you sense a great soberness, a burden, that's why. I, 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 just, I just don't understand and I, I want to take as many people to heaven as I can. So if you would, let's take our Bibles. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10 through 18. And if you would, let's stand for the reading of the word. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickednesses in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor. Repeat that, the whole armor. I feel like... The, too many times as Christians we tend to say, okay, I'll take the shield of faith, but I'm not going to have the helmet of salvation. I'll take this, but I, won't, I don't want to take that. But the Bible says, 
to take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Do you believe we're there? Do you believe we're in an evil day tonight? And having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Heavenly Father, God, we love you, God. We praise you and we thank you for tonight, God. Lord, and I just ask, God, for the next few moments, God, that you'll hide me behind the cross, God. Lord, and I pray that they'll hear, God, what I believe, God, that you have for us to hear tonight, God. Lord, we are at the end of the end, God. You're about to send Jesus to come get his children. You're about to send him. You're about to say, son, go get my children. And God, I'm, I want to be with you. I want to go, but God, I'm so heartbroken tonight. The millions of millions of people, God, that is stepping out into an eternity of hell, God. Lord, now help us to hear tonight, God. Lord, when we leave, God, let us be challenged and let us be encouraged and let us be changed for the good. God, we give you all the glory, all the honor and the praise. And everybody said, Amen. You might be seated. So tonight I want to talk to you for just a little while along the lines of the armor of God. Church, it's time that we armor up and be ready. I was talking to Sister Patty before. I said, I've, I said, I feel like the greatest attack is on the ministers of the gospel. Man, female, it doesn't matter. I said, then right under that, I feel like the next thing is hell's doing what he can to destroy marriages. Trying to break the marriages up. And so tonight, we're going to talk a little while. I'll try to go fast, I promise, but I, I don't know. It just depends on what the Lord wants, okay? So bear with me. Talking on the armor of God. Church, if there's ever been a time that the body of Christ needs to be ready to fight, it's now. You know, I've heard it all my life. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. I've heard it all my life. People said he's not coming back. Wrong. He's coming back. And I believe before we close tonight, he could step out and come get us. I really do. I, there's days I wonder, God, how have you not already come back? For too long, the church we have set idly by and we become complacent. And I'm not talking about just Cross Park. I'm talking about the body of Christ tonight. For too long we have sat idly by and said, you know what, they're at another church. As long as they're in church, it's okay. Oh, they miss on Wednesday night. That's okay. They'll be here on Sunday morning. No. The Word of God says come together. Listen to me. Anytime, Internet crowd, listen. Anytime that the doors are open at a church, at your church, get to your church. Be there. If he calls a prayer meeting, get to the prayer meeting. If he calls a Wednesday night service, a Sunday night service, a three-day revival, whatever it is, we need to be there. The church has got to stand and got to be the church again if we're going to see people come to the Lord. It's time that we get ready for battle. The devil's going all around this earth seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8 says it like this. Be sober, sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You see, the devil doesn't play favorites. He don't care who you are. If he can get you to stumble and if he can get you to fall, he's going to do it, Brother James. You see, he wants to get you outside of the will of God. He knows that he's destined for hell. He knows the end of the book. He knows he's going to spend an eternity in hell. So he says, I'm going to take as many people with me as I can. He's going to, he wants to share that misery and that pain and that sorrow. You think the devil cares if you go to church? No. As long as you can come into church and sit on the pew and never change, he's fine with that. Matter of fact, he would rather you sit in a church lost, dying and going to hell and thinking that you're okay rather than being out in the world knowing that you're lost with a chance to be set free. So tonight I hope we leave here with a little different look on how to do battle against the devil. First, we need to be dressed in the whole armor of God. You see, with the problem of most today, they want to use an armor not made of God. They think they can do it on their own. We think, you know what, 
I've done it this long. I've made it this far. I've done this and I've done that and I can do it on my own. And when the devil sees you, he says, oh, that's just Billy. I can handle him. But when you have the armor of God on, he sees that stamp the approval, the blood of Christ, and therefore he begins to take notice. Okay, I can't just come up against them. I've got to try to sneak in. I've got to try to get a foothold in somewhere. Too many people want to do it that's not made by God, but made by man. They think they can do it on their own. I'm here to tell you that we can't. We have to be dressed in the armor of God in order to defeat the enemy. It is only the armor of God that will stand against the devil. So now I'm going to talk to you for just a little bit on the armor of God, the pieces of God, the pieces of the armor. Number one, the belt of truth is the knowledge of truth of God's word. This is the centerpiece for all other pieces of the armor. The belt was put on first and it helped holds all the other armor pieces in place. And in order to fight the devil, we must know the truth which is the Word of God, and we must wrap it around us and have the Word of God in us, out of us, inside out, backwards, upside down, whatever you want to say, however you want to say it, but we've got to know the Word of God. Now, how do we use the belt of truth? Number one, we have to start our day in the Word. Every morning, we've got to read the Word of God. You know, I've, I'll be honest with you, I'm not the one that that likes to read a bunch of different books. I, I love the Word. I love to read the Bible. Other than that, I do have some books that I can read, but for the most part, I usually hang close to the Word of God. But I've heard people say, oh, you know, you don't have to read it. Oh, I can do it this way or I can do it that way. And I told the young people a few, few weeks ago, I said, you don't have to study the playbook. You don't ever have to open up the playbook. And read it and study it. I said, but when the coach calls on you and you mess up, don't be mad at him because the teacher gave you the playbook. You didn't study it. And it's the same way with the Word of God. God has given us His Word, but are we reading it and studying it every day? It's important to start your day off with God. Did you know that how you start your day is vital to winning the daily battles that we will face every day? We should spend some time with God and in His Word. It's so important that we immerse ourselves in God's Word without distractions. Now, I know that's hard to do. And I don't know about you, but there'll be times I go to pray or go to read, it seems like that phone rings off the hook. Somebody comes to the door. Every time. And it's important, though, that we block a little bit of time 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is. We block off a little time. We shut the phone off. We shut the door. Don't let nobody in. And we spend just a little bit of time with God. This is how we prepare. This is how you prepare your mind for the battles of the day. Is with God. On our knees with God. I know that for me, when I pray or read first thing in the morning, it seems that my day doesn't always go easy. I face things, but I feel like I've got an advantage over it. I've started my morning off with God, and the devil's tried to throw something in there. But you know what, devil? God warned me of this. God showed me you were going to be dumb and try to do something, but because I spent time in prayer with God, I was able to overcome it. You see, I'm able to handle whatever life throws at me. Number two, end your day in the Word. Before we lay down at night, we should spend some time studying the Word of God. We should read the Word of God. We should wake up with the Word of God in our heart. Go to sleep with the Word of God in our heart. God's Word must be first thing when we wake up in the morning and the last thing on our mind when we go to sleep, thinking on the things of God. I hear people, I hear people fearful to go to sleep. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't have that problem. You can ask my wife, my head hits the pillow, within probably 30 seconds, I'm gone. It's, that's, I'm out. Now, there are some nights that I can't sleep, but it's very rare. But you see, I hear people that are fearful and they can't go to sleep. They're worried about this and they're worried about that. And the problem is that we're not, we're not 
putting our time in with the Lord. And so because we don't study and pray and do as God's asked us to do, therefore we, we're living in fear that the White House is going to mess up or the government's going to, honey, they're messed up, okay? I mean, they're way out, They're not even in the ballpark. But God is sitting on the throne still. He's not up in heaven pacing and twiddling his thumbs and what am I going to do? Biden's done something else that he shouldn't have done. Kamala's doing something that she shouldn't. You know what? We should pray for them every day. Do I like their decisions? No. Did I vote for them? No. But I pray for them. He needs God just as much as we do. You see, there's so much trash on the television if we're not careful. And I'm not against TV, okay? I don't preach the one-eyed monster. But there is stuff on that that can cause you to slip in your walk with God. And if we allow it, we're not careful, we began to live in an unhealthy fear because we've allowed the TV to fill our heads with all of that garbage that America this, all this, and all that. We know it's in bad shape, but you don't have to sit there all the time and stare at it. Let it go and give it to God. Before we go to bed, let's read the Word of God. Let's pray before we lay our heads down. Number three, memorize scriptures based on the lies that you are struggling with. You see, the Bible is our God. Whatever you need is in the Word of God. And remember, God's the author. You got any questions, go to the Word of God and say, Father, I don't understand. Help me. God is the Creator. He created all things. It doesn't matter what you need. It doesn't matter what circumstance of life that you're in tonight. It doesn't matter if the doctor said, oh, this is not going to be good for you. Or the banker said, you know, we're going to have to take this. And we're going to have to take that from you. It doesn't matter because as long as we walk and do the will of God, he will take care of his children. If you're struggling with fear, well, here's a few verses that will help out. You see, fear is a common emotion that we often feel. The ways of fear is an unsettledness, worried, anxious all the time. There's some 365 times in the Bible where it talks of the fearing not. Don't be fearful. One for every day of the year. How good is that? That the Lord thought about us. I know, Billy, he's going to worry this day and he's going to worry this day, but every day I'm going to tell him, don't fear. It's going to be all right. Isaiah 41 and 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. That's God Almighty talking to us. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, I don't know if you know this about me, but... I. I believe the Old Testament and the New Testament is for all of us. I don't believe in just the New Testament. I don't believe just the Old. I believe it all comes together. You've got to have the Old with the New. I've heard people say, we're just the New Testament and that's it. And so whenever I'm praying and I'm studying, I always ask God to help me find scriptures in the Old and in the New. Isaiah, 2 Timothy, now Psalm 34 and 4. I sought the Lord and He heard me and He delivered me from my fears. Psalm 27 and 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That right there will preach in itself. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is, my, is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? These are just a few of the many scriptures that tell us not to fear. And we don't have to. But you see, there are so many people out there that are struggling with some kind of fear. And it may not be fear. It can be other things. But fear is just one I felt the Lord was tugging on me just to talk on the fear for a moment. Don't fear, child. It don't matter what, what you're going through. I don't care what the doctors told you. I mean, according to doctors, I shouldn't be here. According to a state trooper, when I got hit by the log truck, he said, for that young man to walk out of that wreck without a scratch on his body is a miracle. I had a log truck run over my pickup truck, a single cab F-150. He was loaded to the gills with logs. Hit me in the rear and fishtail, and I run under his truck, and he ran up on it. That state trooper looked at my mom and said, I don't, I don't know why he's here. 
So don't fear. Until God's finished with you, you ain't going nowhere. Now on the other side of this, listen. We can cause an early death ourselves. If you get out there and you want to act dumb and act crazy, jumping off of bridges into shallow water, I mean, that's, you're asking. Okay, you're asking for it. Number two, talk about the breastplate of righteousness. This piece of the armor protects our vital organs in the heat of battle. You see, whenever we aren't quick enough to take up the shield of faith, the breastplate is there. It's there for the quick and unexpected advances of the enemy. How many has ever been growing up, if you have a sibling, you ever been sucker punched? Somebody caught you off guard, sucker punched you. See, that breastplate of righteousness was there for them soldiers when they would come and they couldn't get their shield up in time, that breastplate would protect them. Thank God for the breastplate. As believers, we have no righteousness apart from Christ. The breastplate is His righteousness. How many know that His righteousness will never fail? I heard somebody the other day, they were talking about the Roman soldier's armor was somewhere around 70 pounds. Can you imagine carrying 70 pounds into battle? And they were talking about most of it was on the breastplate. And it would weigh them down and so the breastplate would hook to the belt. And it would take most of the weight off of their shoulders. And as she was speaking, she said, you know, so many people want to try to live in our own righteousness and we want to try to do it our way. And said, you can see the ceiling up here and I don't care how good of an athlete you are, but you ain't going to jump up and touch that ceiling. I'm not going to jump up and touch that ceiling. I would love to be able to, but it ain't happening. And it's the same way as that's God's righteousness. We're never, we can't, get, we can't do it. But with the righteousness of God, we can do it. So many times people want to think it's us. But it has to be God. You see, we, even though we have no righteousness of our own, we must still, by His power, choose to do right. We must live right, be rooted in God's Word, denying our flesh and defeating the enemy. Being rooted in the Word of God is powerful in protecting your heart. How to use the breastplate of righteousness. Number one, identify righteousness, righteous activities in your life that strengthen you. And it may be as simple as witnessing to a homeless person, witnessing to the lady in Walmart or to the man in Walmart, getting to know them. Don't just... They're not as holy as I am. They don't look like I do. He's got this and she's got that and all this and all of that, honey. I'll tell you what. I saw something. It's been a little while ago. Had three people sitting on a bench. One man covered from head to toes in tattoos and just got arrested or whatever. Had a lawyer looking type guy, suit and tie, and he's sitting there looking like, who does he think he is? Then another lady was just like, who does... That man think he is. And the man that's just been arrested and don't look good in our eyes, we think that he's a castaway. He's sitting there and he's saying, I just wish somebody would tell me about Jesus. Reminds me of a story. This man, this pastor and evangelist went to this restaurant to eat and the evangelist kind of got ugly with the waitress. She was taking too long. It wasn't coming and he got ugly with her, and then so they started leaving. The pastor said, well, before we leave, I want you to go over there and tell that young lady about Jesus. I try to tell my kids all the time, watch every move we make. Somebody is watching us. But you see, we got to identify these righteousness activities, love on people, show them the love of God. We need to be about the Father's business. We have to live a holy life and show the love of God to all people. Number two, identify unrighteous activities in your life that weakens you. This can be anything. As an example, I'll just use this. When someone watches TV or movies constantly, they just they watch it and they watch it and they watch it. And maybe they're watching something. It's not really that bad, but it doesn't go with what we believe. And so they tend to want to justify it. And before long, it doesn't matter what they say, but before long... They'll have them rooting for that young lady to leave her husband for that young, charming man. I don't know if any of you have ever seen Hallmark movies. Anybody? Oh, young man, young woman, they're going to get married, they're engaged, and all of a sudden they broke off and she's over here with this hunk. 
And all the while, that's what they've been trying to do, is to get you to want her to leave for him. And I'm not picking on Hallmark, okay? Hallmark is the, probably the cleanest program, okay? Well, not Hallmark anymore. It's fun. It's something else. But anyways, you see, we have to be careful. And we can't allow the things that we allow into our eyes, into our brain, into our mind to just say, you know what, it's okay. We can't allow that. There are always things that is going to try to tear us down and to get us to fall. All the while, we are allowing, as we watch it and as we do these things, we're allowing the walls that Christ built up around us, the hedge of protection, we're allowing them to be weakened and to be brought down. Listen to me, protect you and your family at all cost. You see, there's nothing worth losing your soul. Me and Wendy talk about it all the time. Zach's 12 years old and he still loves cartoons. There's kids his age watching things that X-rated movies and rated R and all kinds of things. And I just, I can't. I'm trying to protect him. Because it won't be long and he'll be on his own. He'll grow up. He'll be 18, 19, 20 years old and he'll move out and he'll be on his own. And I want him to be able to say, you know what? And look back, my mom and daddy was protecting me. They didn't just let me watch this. They didn't let me just watch that. They didn't let me go do this. They didn't let me just skip church for this. But no, they took me to the house of God and they showed me how important it is to be in a relationship with Christ. I saw a thing today that said 0.02873% of a chance your child will be a professional athlete. But a 100% chance they will stand before God. I don't know about you. You kids are probably groaning out, but I just said, I've told Zach, I said, son, I, I want you to excel in sports. I want you to love what you do and all that good stuff. I said, but when the rubber meets the road, this is first. The will of God is more important than a, a trophy or more important than being the number one athlete. I, I, I want him to do well, and I just, but I don't want him to forget God. I want him to try for the kingdom of God harder than he ever did for the football team. So protect you and your family at all costs. Number three, the feet shod with the gospel of peace. The soldiers, they had their sandals and it was fitted to their feet. And they had some kind of spike or a hobnail in the bottom of it. And the reason being is so that when they're traveling, they would have a firm grip. So it had little, almost like golf shoes. Anybody ever seen golf shoes? They got those spikes. So when you're swinging, you don't move. You got a firm foundation. You got a sure grip. And so that's why they did that. With that being said, it allowed them to have that firm foundation. But as a believer in Christ, Where's our firm foundation? Are we having that firm foundation? And we do, and it's in the gospel of Christ. We have peace in knowing that we are secure in Jesus Christ for what He did for us at Calvary. How to use the gospel of peace. Number one, preach the gospel to yourself daily. To yourself daily. Remind yourself of the goodness of God when the devil tells you this ain't going to happen, this ain't going to happen, this is going to happen, this is terrible. Can he gets you down and out. Remind him of what God has already done. Remind him of the goodness of God. Remind yourself of the goodness of God. Look back at all the times that God has delivered you. Now some of us have been saved a mighty long time. And if I was asking you to come up here and tell us of all the goodnesses of God on your life, We'd be here till Jesus comes back. Remember, your hope is in Christ Jesus. Jesus went to the cross for you and I. And because of His sacrifice and your belief in Him, you will not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says it like this. You can all quote it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should what? Should not perish but have everlasting life. Don't wait until a hardship that will cause you to be reminded. Church, listen. Every day, remind yourself of this. Remind yourself of the goodness of God and you can overcome. I've seen it in my own life. I get down and out and I've had people come up to me. Man, you remember when God did this. 
You remember when God did that? Thank God they weren't, you're just so negative. You need to get up. Bless God. No, they were trying to help me. And I, I pray and ask God to help me when I see somebody down. Don't go over and kick them. Oh, do you remember, Sister Barbara, when Jesus saved your soul? You remember when he filled you with the Holy Ghost? Oh, I remember, brother. Before long, she come in here all down and out, but now she's jumping. She's running laps around the building because somebody took the time to encourage her. Number two, share your testimonies with others. Don't, don't hold it in. Don't hold it in. I mean, we've got the answer to every problem. We've got the answer to every situation. Tell everybody the good news of Jesus. Tell them what he's done for you. I know some people think they have to have a pulpit or they need a mic, but you don't have to. I ran into a lady the other day, me and Sister Susan. She was at Walmart, and she was talking to the lady, walked up to her, and next thing I know, we we're about to have church right there in the Walmart door. People could... But I'd rather them look at me that way for the cause of Christ than for anything else. Share it with people at your workplace. Share it with your family, your friends, people at the store, wherever you are. Just be a friend to somebody. Be kind and show the love of Jesus to all people. Share your testimonies. Number three, be a living example. I tell the youth, it's all, I tell them all the time. Now, I'm going to say that I tell the youth all the time. I'm their pastor. I'm the youth pastor. I love them. I tell them all the time I love them. I said, I pray for you. I said, I'm praying for your marriages. I'm praying for your kids. I'm praying for your kids' job, your kids' school. They said, whoa, I ain't even dating nobody. I said, but it will happen. And I said, if I can start now praying the devil off of you now, maybe whenever you do meet Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright, you won't act a fool and mess it up. Because you want to chase that little short tail girl. Or you want to chase that young man with that tank top. That muscles looks like Samson. And I tell them all the time, somebody's watching you. I don't care how old you are. You may be the oldest person here tonight. You may be the youngest. But somebody is watching you. Whenever you were walking with Christ, walking in the will of God, showing the fruits of the Spirit, and I mean the fruits of God's Spirit, not of a man's Spirit, then people will stop and say, Oh my God, there is something different about her. She ain't like most church people I go to church with. There's something different about her. You see, they'll stop and they'll recognize, they'll take notice, and then maybe... Something will change in their life. Sad story was told to me here a few years ago. A man witnessed to a lady here in Bristol, Tennessee, said the name of Jesus, and she said, What is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Right here in the Bible Belt of Tennessee. Everybody knows about Jesus. No, not everybody does. And what if, Brother Allen? If you're the only Jesus that they'll ever see. Number four, moving on. I got to hurry. Shield of faith. Taking God at his word by believing his promises. The soldier's shield was, was, a, was the primary defense weapon. It was made of impenetrable wood, leather, canvas, and metal and could be doused into water to extinguish fiery arrows from the enemy. You see, faith is the believer's shield. We must trust God in His power, trust God in His protection at all times. This is, this is imperative in remaining steadfast. When the battle is hot, listen to me, when the battle is hot, remember that God is working all things for you to the good. He will always be faithful and true to His promises. Now, I've, I just felt a little kickback on Things for the good, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God. To them who are called according to His purpose. Even when it looks terrible, remember God is in control and everything will be okay. I like the way Dad said it before. I'm just going to repeat it. It's like baking a cake. How many of you like red velvet cake? Chocolate cake? Okay, whatever cake you like. Carrot cake, pineapple, whatever. 
Think about it for a moment. Let your tongue and your lips begin to water on how good that cake is. So as you're making a cake, some of you in here cook. There's flour. There's eggs. You got butter. Sometimes sugar, sometimes salt, and milk, and baking soda. For the most part, flour by itself ain't no good. A raw egg, now some people like raw eggs, but for the most part, people don't like just a raw egg. And I don't know of anybody who'll take a stick of butter, just take a hunk out of it. So alone, it's not good. But in the long run, after it's completed, after mama's been in the kitchen or grandma's been in the kitchen mixing and doing and got dust or a flour everywhere and got eggs everywhere and everything else everywhere, she can put it in the oven. Then the fire can begin to cook and to bake it and do what it does and that cake rises. By now, my mouth's already watering, okay? And when she, she pulls it out, she puts it up on the counter, I said, I want a piece now. Honey, I ain't even got the icing on it. You're going to have to wait. I'm like, well, honey, you better hurry. She said, it's too hot. If you put the icing on too soon, it just melts. But oh, when she pulls it out and she lets it cool for a minute, she wraps it with that icing. Mm. And she says, honey, it's time. Then that cake's worth eating. And that's the way it is with our walk with God. It don't look good from point A to point B. It may be ugly here. It may be dark here. It may be just the worst time of our life here. But when it's all said and done, and we're with Jesus Christ, we'll be like that delicious red velvet cake. How to use the shield of faith. I've got to move on. I'm sorry. Number one, take time to remember the promises of God. Do you have any promises that God give you? God's never give you a promise. He's given me promises and He's fulfilled them. Not all of them, but most of them. But if He has, then remember them. When the fiery darts try to impact your heart, try to come in and destroy your heart, put them out by remembering the goodness of God over you and your life. I'll give you a few scriptures. Just I'll read them for the sake of time. You don't have to. Deuteronomy 31 and 6. Be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid. For the, light, the Lord thy God, He is with you. He is that doth go with thee. And He will what? Not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Philippians 4.19 says it like this. Four nineteen, But my God shall supply half of my needs. No, it says, my God will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Proverbs 3, 5, and then we'll move on. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge Him. And He what? He will direct thy paths. Church, we have to allow God to do it again. We have to let God direct our path. He will make us walk straight. Number two, a soldier's shield was the strongest when they were linked one with another. You see, it was important that we come together and to be in service with one another. When we come together, then we can get the mind of God, not the mind of Billy, not the mind of Brother Daryl, but we can get the mind of God. And once we're here and we have the mind of God, then God comes into the building and things happen. Things change. People are healed. Marriages are restored when we come together in one mind and one accord. Deuteronomy 32, 30. There talks about one putting a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. We're not here to have our own mind and our own opinions, but we're about the mind of Christ. Number three. Revisit or recount God's past victories in your life. How many of you have ever had a victory? Amen. You've had a victory. We should look back on it and see what God has brought us through. If we've had hard times, if we wake up in the morning and we're struggling with this or struggling with that, just take a look back in the archives and say, Oh, I remember in 1982, God saved me. 1983, God filled me. 1996, God saved my marriage. And you know, just began to see what God has done and let it build your faith. If you have a hard time remembering, make a list. Whenever you... Whenever you feel your faith begins to waver, go back to the list. Revisit it. 
Look at it again and watch your faith begin to grow. Number five, the helmet of salvation. It's the hope of salvation. It's one of the most important pieces of the armor. Without the helmet, one blow to the head could be fatal. You see, the helmet covers the entire head, the facial area, and the eyes, and between the eyes. Without the helmet, the rest of the armor would be useless. You see, in a Christian's life, without salvation, all of it's useless. All of it's useless. I don't care if you know every word in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, front and back, upside down, inside out. I don't care. If you're not saved, then it's all useless. You've got to have salvation. How to use the helmet of salvation. Number one, stand on the conviction of your salvation in Christ. I, I added in Christ, I had it stand on the conviction of your salvation, but there's so many ways now to be saved or this or that and so I wanted to change it and put in Christ because when you have the blueprint you can't change it when you're measuring up to the word of God you can't change it because Jesus died on the cross and you accepted him as the Lord of your heart knowing this will carry you through your hard times even in the darkest times we can be assured that we're going to go home with Jesus as long as we live for Jesus Number two, place your thoughts on things above. Be ready to go. Listen to messages and sermons and whatever you want to call them. Listen to them that have been preached by men and women of God. Now just because they have a large following doesn't mean they're preaching truth. I'll, in, I'll even go as far as to say, if you find a man or a woman that not many people are listening to or not following, you might want to just check them out. Because they may be preaching the truth. And this generation of people don't like the truth. They didn't like it in Stephen's day. That's why they stoned it. Because it messed with them. It pricked their hearts. And they hated him for it. It's like the physical man. How many of you like to eat? How many of you struggle telling the truth? I'm just kidding. The physical man wants to eat. I love to eat. I love my desserts first. But so does that spirit man. And for so long, the church across the board has starved the spirit man. We live off of what the preacher's going to preach. He read a two or three verses, and that's about the, the end of it. Allow God to lead you to the right message from the right man or the right woman of God. Number six, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Different than others, the sword is an offensive weapon. Our sword is the word of God, both written and incarnate word. You see, Jesus used the word against the devil when he was tempted, and he defeated the devil. We too must do the same thing. How to use the sword of the Spirit. Number one, arm yourself. You know how you arm yourself? You read the Bible. You study the word. You do it at times when you don't have to be distracted by everything, when you can get along with God. Number two, when attacked, fight back with the Word of God. The devil hates the Word of God. Satan attacked Jesus and Jesus said, No, for it is written. It's written, devil. You see, we must do the same thing. Quote the Word of God and watch Him lose the battle every time. When you feel beaten down, immerse yourself in the Word of God. I want you to know that you're going to have days, you're not backslidden, but you just don't feel all right. Something's just not right today. I just feel down. I feel down and I feel out. And we can see where David seemed that all was lost. Siglag was burned by fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters, everything was taken captive. David was greatly distressed due to the fact that the men wanted to stone him. Not just any men, but his men. His men wanted to stone him. However, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Some of us have to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Stay in the Word of God for all things. You see, this is the armor of God. But I want to add one more to it, if you don't mind. Number seven, prayer. I know it's not a physical piece of the armor, but I believe it's one of the most important pieces. You can dress up, put the armor of God, you can do all of that stuff. But if you don't prepare yourself, in prayer, it does no good. It shows that we have to rely upon God to act and to move. The entire 
armor is rooted in God's strength, not ours. Without God, we are powerless in the battle. How do you use prayer? Pray when you open your eyes. Before you start your day, begin in prayer. Number two, pray impulsively throughout the day. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. This will cause you not to just pray the same prayer every time. I know we, we matter of fact, the other night, Wendy told the kids, said you don't have to pray the exact same prayer every night. You don't have to get an autopilot. You can pray different things. And so if you're praying continuously, you're praying without ceasing, I'll get a phone call throughout the day to pray for somebody. Now, in the morning time, I didn't pray for them. I didn't know about it. But I get the phone call, and I began to pray about that. I don't go right back and pray what I prayed this morning. I prayed that. Now, I moved on to something else. Pray about all things. Number three, have a conversation with God on your knees before you go to bed. And you say, why on your knees? If you can get down on your knees, the reason being what an honor. To bow before the Heavenly Father. Lord, I surrender. I'm submitting myself to you. Thank Him for your day and for all your blessings. Just talk to God. How many of you had children? How many of them don't live near you and you don't get to see them? They usually have to call you on the phone, okay? Now, when you see, just say, Bob calls, your son Bob calls. Well, I'll call him back. No. Everybody be quiet. Bob's calling. Hey, Bob, how are you? It's the same way with God. He loves when we just want to talk with Him. But for so long, for so many times, I just, this is just me talking. God didn't tell me this, but I just, I can just imagine in my brain thinking like this. Oh, it's Billy again. He must be in trouble. The last time Billy wanted to talk to me, his marriages were on the rocks. Or this was happening or that was happening. The only time I hear from Billy is when he needs something. He loves when his children just want to spend time with him. It's time that the church gets armored up and get ready for the battle ahead. Resting in knowing that God is in control. Church, we have to be ready to do battle. We're almost home. That doesn't mean we get to... Lay down and quit. That means we got to stand up tall. we got to be ready at all times because you never know who's going to walk through the door of your life. You never know what opportunity will be opened. We know that the war has been won. Christ won the war. But however, there are daily battles that we must face that we will have to fight. If you would, let's stand. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christ false prophets and they shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect now I don't consider myself very elect so I pray and ask God every day God please don't let me be deceived God please don't let me be deceived so I hope tonight after this message I hope that we've heard something from God and I pray that we'll leave here walking a little bit different maybe we'll have a little more boldness in Christ if you would, please, let's come to these altars for a few moments and let's just respond to the message. Ask God to help us.